last day of the ancient festival, January 6th, marked the end of the Yuletide, and in the mountains of a century ago, people celebrated that day with an age-old tradition called Breaking Up Christmas. The community gathered for an all-night party. The local musicians took out their mandolins and fiddles and played reels, and old ballads brought from Britain, and every other form of musical merriment they knew. The revels ended at sunrise on January 7th, and when the people returned home to resume the task of their day-to-day existence, the holiday was over. Christmas had been broken up for another year. Nora Bone Steals Christmas Past by Sharon McCrum from number 10.5 in her ballad series. Hi, this is Carla. Happy New Year, and welcome back to There Might Be Cupcakes. I am writing this on the eve of Twelfth Night as Virginia awaits the beginning of a second snowstorm, which we got. On the heels of that snow that trapped everyone on their journey down Highway 95 to the Capitol. That was horrible. That felt very symbolic given Epiphany and the travels of the wise men, at least to me given my mood writing this, so bear with me. Let me read to you what came up in my Facebook memories for today. So here it is, from your favorite hippie Episcopalian. I wrote this January 6, 2016, one year before I set up the social media for this podcast and announced it's coming. Happy 12th day of Christmas. Yes, like the song. Today is Epiphany, in which we observe the arrival of the Magi as witnesses to Jesus' birth. Imagine, three disparate rulers coming together and cooperating. I know, right? On every detail it took to traverse the desert safely, going on the world of a power-mad Uber ruler. They packed gifts, expensive fragrant oils, and set off, trusting their travel to the darkness, as desert travelers do. Darkness need not be fearful. Sometimes, like this time, it is absolutely necessary for contrast and illumination. They followed the light of the stars to keep themselves in their general course, and then... One star did not behave as it should, burning too brightly, not in the correct position. Much like Jesus the rabbi would, much like most fiercely good people do. These kings trusted their instincts, trusted the darkness, and trusted the strange light. And in turn, they were entrusted with a mysterious epiphany. They did not understand the full meaning of this new light, only that the madman king of kings should never hear their report of it. So these travel gritty, exhausted, and probably a little frightened kings, they chose another road home and pondered and changed perhaps with each step. They were magi, wise men, before wise in the ways of the world, such as diplomacy and astronomy. Now after, they knew there was great wisdom in simply admitting and resting in mystery. So for me, epiphany is about frightening first steps, trusting what lies ahead, and resting safely in the great I don't know. Sometimes this revelation, the epiphany, is just that, and that's just what you need at the moment. I have no idea where chronic illness is taking me, but I figure if God is the great I am, I am the kind of shiny I don't know. I will receive more reveal as I need more. Happy Twelfth Night. Unquote. I use the McCrum quote because her books are written about the Appalachian Mountains where I live, and I also love the idea about taking down the Christmas decorations as breaking up Christmas. It brings a certain Amish barn building pastiche to it and makes it quite cheerful. Taking down the decorations has always made me melancholy, you know, when I was younger, and it kind of still does, to the point that mom would usually excuse me from the chore. It depressed me for a reason I really couldn't name. It wasn't necessarily that Christmas was over. It was the bare spaces left by the tree and the greenery and the familiar happy objects we placed out every year, some in honor of my little brother. Some light was gone. Making it into a community party with bluegrass music would have definitely changed my mind, replacing light for light. For today, I'm reading another Victorian horror story by a woman, as I did in the last episode, this time by E. Nesbitt. She's known as a children's author probably know her but as the author of Five Children in It or The Railway Children. The first modern children's author for placing children and their families in normal situations and strife rather than fantasy, like Lewis Carroll, for example. But she wrote several collections of horror short stories for adults. Grim Tales in 1893, from which this story comes. Something Wrong, also in 1893. Man and Maid, which has some supernatural horror stories in it in 1906, after the end of the Victorian era. 
and fear in 1910, also in the Edwardian era. The E stands for Edith. She was born August 15, 1858 in Kennington, Surrey, and died May 4, 1924, at age 65 in New Romney, Kent. She was an active socialist, and her home life was more full of drama than a real housewife of the UK. Her husband also had another wife who was pregnant at the same time. Then he later impregnated her best friend, and he threatened to abandon... She- <laughs> okay, this is a little complicated. Her husband also had another wife who was pregnant at the same time as Nesbitt was. Then he later impregnated Nesbitt's best friend. And Nesbitt threatened to abandon him and her child unless he abandoned the other two women and children. It's a whole dramatic mess. <laughs> I, I don't know how she had the time or energy to write as much as she did. I really don't. And this level of debauchery is really surprising for the Victorian period. Now, I know they weren't as Puritan as we say they were. All the jokes about covering table legs because they might turn men on. But there were morality laws governing familial behavior. Oof. I was exhausted researching her life. I can't imagine how exhausting it was for all the players involved. And she ended up writing, get this, 14 children's novels, 26 picture books and storybooks for children, 13 novels for adults, and 5 short story collections for adults. And then she wrote a lot of poetry and nonfiction pieces about socialism. What the what? Back to Victorian Christmas. To the dark cobblestone streets one more time this season, this twelfth night. The street lamps are lit, wreaths garnish every door, and street vendors in the park sell wassail and cider and paper cones of hot nuts. Come to my door. The chambermaid will let you in and see you to my study, where the fire has been lit for hours. It's the warmest room in my brownstone, and there's a lovely view of the park where we can watch the snow fall. Take a seat on the velvet settee or by the hearth. Cover yourself with a hearth rug. The maid has brought a tray of roasted chestnuts, wassail, cider, and cocoa. Pass it about, please. I'll snuff the lamps if you don't mind. Atmosphere. Don't be frightened. There's enough light from the fire and from the moon reflecting off the snow banks. Draw closer to the fire and to each other. Don't be shy. The last story of this season is called Man-Sized and Marble. Before I read, if you are new to the podcast and are interested in the history of the 12 days of Christmas and that eponymous song, I explored it in episode 67, Haunted Yule 12 Days. I've linked to its Podchaser page in the show notes. One more reference to Epiphany and to another episode before I read the story to you. It's also from Sharon McCrum's ballad series, and it talks about Nora Bonesteel, the mountain wise woman, gathering her balm of Gilead at the end of the Christmas season. For more about the balm of Gilead and why it's named so, you can listen to episode 54, Gilead Meaning in Place. It's also linked to the show notes. Nora Bonesteel always gathered her balm of Gilead buds on Epiphany if the day was fine. When Nora was a girl, a few of the old women had claimed that balm of Gilead ought to be harvested at dawn or dusk, but these days she dispensed with that part of the ritual. Early morning and evening were colder than midday, and she was too old to brave a chill for the sake of rough magic. She understood the logic behind the stricture, though. There was a power in the borders of things, in the twilight that separated day from night, in rivers that divided lands in the caves and wells that lay suspended between the earth and the underworld. The ancient holy days had been the divisions between summer and winter, and that border in time created a threshold for other things. The mountains themselves were a border, Nora thought. They separated the placid coastal plain from the flatlands to the west, and there was magic in them. Sharon McCrum, The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter, number two in her ballad series. Happy transition. The song that follows today's story is an excellent transitional epiphany song from Rue Royale's Christmas EP called, appropriately enough, What Next, Dear One? This EP is linked in the show notes. You've heard their lovely music on my show before. I hope you enjoy, and I hope next this next season, this fresh January, brings you health, safety, enjoyable reading, a good safe scare, and hope. All of the above describes cupcakes. I hope there might be cupcakes, and I will see you soon. Until then, and now, Man-Sized in Marble by E. Nesbitt from Grim Tales.
although every word of this story is as true as despair. I do not expect people to believe it. Nowadays, a rational explanation is required before belief is possible. Let me then at once offer the rational explanation, which finds most favor among those who have heard the tale of my life's tragedy. It is held that we were under a delusion, Laura and I, on that 31st of October, and that this supposition places the whole matter on a satisfactory and believable basis. The reader can judge, when he too has heard my story, how far this is an explanation, and what sense it is rational. There were three who took part in this, Laura and I and another man. The other man still lives and can speak to the truth of the least credible part of my story. I never in my life knew what it was to have as much money as I required to supply the most ordinary needs, good colors, books, and cab fares. And when we were married, we knew quite well that we should only be able to live at all by strict punctuality and attention to business. I used to paint in those days, and Laura used to write, and we felt sure we could keep the pot at least simmering. Living in town was out of the question, so we went to look for a cottage in the country, which should be at once sanitary and picturesque. So rarely do those two qualities meet in one cottage that our search was for some time quite fruitless. We tried advertisements, but most of the desirable rural residences which we did look at proved to be lacking in both essentials. And when a cottage chanced to have drains, it always had stucco as well and was shaped like a tea caddy. And if we found a vine or rose-covered porch, corruption invariably lurked within. Our minds got so befogged by the eloquence of house agents and the rival disadvantages of the fever traps and outrageous to beauty which we had seen and scorned that I very much doubt whether either of us on our wedding morning knew the difference between a house and a haystack. But when we got away from friends and house agents on our honeymoon, our wits grew clear again and we knew a pretty cottage when at last we saw one. It was at Brenzett, a little village set in a hill against the southern marshes. We'd gone there from the seaside village where we were staying to see the church, and two fields from the church we found this cottage. It stood quite by itself, about two miles from the village. It was a long, low building with rooms sticking out in unexpected places. There was a bit of stonework, ivy covered and moss grown, just two old rooms, all that was left of a big house that had once stood there, and round this stonework the house had grown up. Stripped of its roses and jasmine, it would have been hideous. As it stood, it was charming, and after a brief examination, we took it. It was absurdly cheap. The rest of our honeymoon we spent in grubbing about in second-hand shops in the county town, picking up bits of old oak and Chippendale chairs for our furnishing. We wound up with a run-up to town and a visit to Liberty's, and soon the low oak-beamed lattice-windowed rooms began to be home. There was a jolly old-fashioned garden with grass paths and no end of hollyhocks and sunflowers and big lilies. From the window, you could see the marsh pastures and beyond them the blue, thin line of the sea. We were as happy as the summer was glorious and settled down into work sooner than we ourselves expected. I was never tired of sketching the view and the wonderful cloud effects from the open lattice, and Laura would sit at the table and write verses about them, in which I mostly played the part of foreground. We got a tall old peasant woman to do for us. Her face and figure were good, though her cooking was of the homeliness. But she understood all about gardening, and she told us all the names of the coppices and cornfields and the stories of the smugglers and highwaymen and, better still, of the things that walked and of the sights which met one in lonely glens of a starlight night. She was a great comfort to us, because Laura hated housekeeping as much as I loved folklore, and we soon came to leave all the domestic business to Mrs. Dorman, and to use her legends and little magazine stories which brought in the jingling guinea. We had three months of married happiness, and did not have a single quarrel. One October evening I had been down to smoke a pipe with the doctor, our only neighbor, a pleasant young Irishman. Laura had stayed at home to finish a comic sketch of a village episode for the monthly Marplot. I left her laughing over her own jokes and came in to find her a crumpled heap of pale muslin weeping on a window seat. Good heavens, my darling, what's the matter? I cried, taking her in my arms. She leaned her little dark head against my shoulder and went on crying. I'd never seen her cry before. We'd always been so happy, you see, and I felt sure some frightful misfortune had happened. What is the matter? Do speak. It's Mrs. Dorman, 
she sobbed. What has she done? I inquired, immensely relieved. She says she must go before the end of the month, and she says her niece is ill. She's gone down to see her now, but I don't believe that's the reason, because her niece is always ill. I believe someone has been setting her against us. Her matter was so queer. Never mind, pussy, I said. Whatever you do, don't cry, or I shall have to cry too to keep you in countenance, and then you'll never respect your man again. She dried her eyes obediently on my handkerchief and even smiled faintly. But you see, she went on, it is really serious, because these vis village people are so sheepy, and if one won't do a thing, you might be quite sure none of the others will. And I shall have to cook the dinners and wash up the hateful greasy plates, and you'll have to carry cans of water about and clean the boots and knives, and we shall never have any time for work or earn any money or anything. We'll have to work all day and only be able to rest when we're waiting for the kettle to boil. I represented to her that even if we had to perform these duties, the day would still present some margin for other toils and recreations. But she refused to see the matter in any but the grayest light. She was very unreasonable, my Laura, but I could not have loved her any more as if she had been as reasonable as Waitley. I'll speak to Mrs. Dorman when, he, when she comes back and see if I can't come to terms with her, I said. Perhaps she wants a rise in her screw. It'll be all right. Let's walk up to the church. The church was a large and lonely one, and we loved to go there, especially upon bright nights. The path skirted a wood, cut through at once, and ran along the crest of the hill through two meadows and round the churchyard wall, over which the old ewes loomed in black masses of shadow. This path, which was partially paved, was called the Beer Balk, for it had long been the way by which the corpses had been carried to burial. The churchyard was richly treed and was shaded by great elms which stood just outside and stretched their majestic arms in benediction over the happy dead. A large, low porch led one into the building by a Norman doorway and a heavy oak door studded with iron. Inside, the arches rose into darkness and between them the reticulated windows, which stood out white in the moonlight. In the chancel, the windows were of rich glass, which showed in faint light their noble coloring, and made the black oak of the choir pews hardly more solid than the shadows. But on each side of the altar lay a gray marble figure of a knight in full plate armor, lying upon a low slab, with hands held up in everlasting prayer. And these figures, oddly enough, were always to be seen if there was any glimmer of light in the church. Their names were lost, but the peasants told of them that they had been fierce and wicked men, marauders by land and sea, who had been the scourge of their time, and who had been guilty of deeds so foul that the house they lived in, the big house, by the way, that had stood on the side of our cottage, had been stricken by lightning and the vengeance of heaven. But for all that, the gold of their heirs had bought them a place in the church. Looking at the bad, hard faces reproduced in the marble, the story was easily believed. The church looked its best and weirdest on that night for the shadows of the yew trees fell through the windows upon the floor of the nave and touched the pillars with tattered shade. We sat down together without speaking and watched the solemn beauty of the old church with some of that awe which inspired its early builders. We walked to the chancel and looked at the sleeping warriors. Then we rested some time on the stone seat of the porch, looking out over the stretch of quiet moonlit meadows, feeling in every fiber of our being the peace of the night and of our happy love and came away at last with the sense that even scrubbing and blackleading was of small troubles at their worst. Mrs. Dorman had come back from the village, and I at once invited her to a tete-a-tete. -tete. Now, Mrs. Dorman, I said, when I'd gotten her into my painting room, what's all this about you not staying with us? I should be glad to get away, sir, before the end of the month, she answered, with her us usual placid dignity. Have you any fault to find, Mrs. Dorman? None at all, sir. You and your lady have always been most kind, I'm sure. Well, what is it? Are your wages not high enough? No, sir, I gets quite enough. Then why not stay? I'd rather not, with some hesitation. My niece is ill. But your niece has been ill ever since we came. No answer. There was a long and awkward silence. I broke it. Can't you stay for another month? I asked. No, sir, I'm bound to go by Thursday. And this was Monday. Well, I must say, I think you might as let us know before. There's no time now to get anyone else, and your mistress is not fit to do heavy housework. Can't you stay until next week? I might be able to come back next week. I was now convinced that all she wanted was a brief holiday, which we would have been willing enough to let her have as soon as we could get a substitute. But why must you go this week, I persisted. Come, out with it. Mrs. Dorman drew the little shawl which she always wore tightly across her bosom, as though she were cold. And then she said, with a sort of effort. 
They say, sir, as this was a big house in Catholic times, and there was a many deeds done here. The nature of the deeds might be vaguely inferred from the inflection of Mrs. Dorman's voice, which was enough to make one's blood run cold. I was glad that Laura was not in the room. She was always nervous, as highly strung natures are, and I felt that these tales about her house, told by the old, this old peasant woman, with her impressive manner and contagious credulity, might have made her homeless dear to my wife. Tell me all about it, Mrs. Dorman, I said. You needn't mind about telling me. I'm not like the young people who make fun of such things. Which is partially true. Well, sir, she sank her voice. You may have seen in the church, beside the altar, two shapes. You mean the effigies of the knights in armor, I said cheerfully. I mean them two bodies, drawed out, man-sized and marble, she returned. And I had to admit that her description was a thousand times more graphic than mine, to say nothing of a certain weird force and uncanniness about the phrase, drawed out, man-sized and marble. They do say, as on All Saints' Eve, them two bodies sits up on their slabs, and gets off of them, and then walks down the aisles in their marble. Another good phrase, Mrs. Dorman. And as the church clock strikes eleven, they walks out the church door, and over the graves, and along the beer balk, and if it's a wet night, there's the marks of their feet in the morning. And where do they go? I asked, fascinated. They comes back here to their home, sir, and if anyone meets them, well, what then? I asked. But no, not another word could I get from her, save that her niece was ill and she must go. After what I'd heard, I scorned to discuss the niece, and I tried to get from Mrs. Dorman more details of the legend. I could get nothing but warnings. Whatever you do, sir, lock the door early on All Saints' Eve, and make the cross sign over the doorstep and on the windows. But has anyone ever seen these things? I persisted. That's not for me to say. I know what I know, sir. Well, who was here last year? No one, sir. The lady has owned the house only stayed here in summer, and she always went to London a full month that before the night. And I'm sorry to inconvenience you and your lady, but my niece is ill, and I must go on Thursday. I could have shaken her for her absurd reiteration of that obvious fiction after she told me her real reasons. She was determined to go, nor could our in united entreaties move her in the least. I did not tell Laura the legend of the shapes that walked in their marble. Partially because a legend concerning our house might perhaps trouble my wife, and partly, I think, for some more occult reason. This was not quite the same to me as any other story, and I did not want to talk about it till the day was over. I had soon ceased to think of the legend, however. I was painting a portrait of Laura against the lattice window, and I could not think of much else. I had got a splendid background of yellow and gray sunset, and was working away with enthusiasm at her face. On Thursday, Mrs. Dorman went. She relented at parting so far as to say, Don't you put yourself about too much, ma'am, and if there's any little thing I can do next week, I'm sure I shan't mind. From which I inferred that she wished to come back to us after Halloween. Up to the last, she adhered to the fiction of the niece with touching fidelity. Thursday passed off pretty well. Laura showed marked ability in the manner of steak and potatoes, and I confess that my knives and the plates, which I insisted upon washing, were better done than I dared to expect. Friday came. It is about what happened on that Friday that this is written. I wonder if I should have believed it if anyone had told it to me. I will write the story of it as quickly and plainly as I can. Everything that happened on that day is burned into my brain. I should not forget anything nor leave anything out. I got up early, I remember, and I lighted the kitchen fire, and I just achieved a smoky success when my little wife came running down as sunny and sweet as the clear October morning itself. We prepared breakfast together and found it very good fun. The housework was soon done, and when brushes and brooms and pails were quiet again, the house was still indeed. It is wonderful what a difference one makes in a house. We really missed Mrs. Dorman, quite apart from considerations concerning pots and pans. We spent the day in dusting our books and putting them straight, and dined gaily on cold steak and coffee. Laura was, if possible, brighter and gayer and sweeter than usual, and I began to think that a little domestic toil was really good for her. We had never been so merry since we were married, and the walk we had that afternoon was, I think, the happiest time of all my life.
When we had watched the deep scarlet clouds slowly pale into leaden gray against a pale green sky and saw the white mist curl up the hedgerows in the distant marsh, we came back to the house silently hand in hand. You are sad, my darling, I said half jestingly as we sat down together in our little parlor. I expected a disclaimer for my own silence had been the silence of complete happiness. To my surprise, she said, yes, I think I am sad or rather I am uneasy. I don't think I'm very well. I've shivered three or four times since we came in, and it's not cold, is it? No, I said, and I hoped it was not a chill caught from the treacherous mists that roll up from the marshes in the dying light. No, she said. She did not think so. Then after a silence, she spoke suddenly. Do you ever have presentiments of evil? No, I said, smiling, and I shouldn't believe in them if I had. I do, she went on. The night my father died, I knew it, though he was right away in the north of Scotland. I did not answer in words. She sat looking at the fire for some time in silence, gently stroking my hand. At last she sprang up, came up behind me, and drawing my head back, kissed me. There, it's over now, she said. What a baby I am. Come light the candles, and we'll have some of these new Rubenstein duets. And we spent a happy hour or two at the piano. At about half past ten, I began to long for the good night pipe, but Laura looked so white that I felt it would be brutal of me to fill our sitting room with the fumes of strong Cavendish. I'll take my pipe outside, I said. Let me come too. No, sweetheart, not tonight. You're much too tired. I shan't be long. Good, get to bed. I shall have an invalid to nurse tomorrow as well as the boots to clean. I kissed her and was turning to go when she flung her arms around my neck and held me as if she would never let me go again. I stroked her hair. Come, pussy, you're overtired. The housework has been too much for you. She loosened her clasp a little and drew a deep breath. No, we've been very happy today, Jack, haven't we? Don't stay out too long. I won't, my dearie. I strolled out the front door, leaving it unlatched. What a night it was. The jagged masses of heavy, dark cloud were rolling in at intervals from horizon to horizon, and thin white wreaths covered the stars. Through all the rush of the cloud river, the moon swam, breasting the waves and disappearing again in the darkness. When now and again her light reached the woodlands, they seemed to slowly and noisily waving in time. When now and again her light reached the woodlands, they seemed to be slowly and noiselessly waving in time to the swing of the clouds above them. There was a strange gray light over all the earth. The fields had that shadowy bloom over them which only comes from the marriage of dew and moonshine, or frost and starlight. I walked up and down, drinking in the beauty of the quiet earth and the changing sky. The night was absolutely silent. Nothing seemed to be abroad. There was no scurrying of rabbits or twitter of the half-asleep birds. And though the clouds were sailing across the sky, the wind that drove them never came low enough to rustle the dead leaves in the woodland paths. Across the meadows, I could see the church tower standing out black and gray against the sky. I walked there thinking over our three months of happiness, and of my wife, her dear eyes, her loving ways. Oh, my little girl, my own little girl. What a vision came then of a long, glad life for you and me together. I heard a bell beat from the church. Eleven already. I turned to go in, but the night held me. I could not go back into our little warm rooms yet. I would go up to the church. I felt vaguely that it would be good to carry my love and thankfulness to the sanctuary whither so much, lo so many loads of sorrow and gladness had been borne by the men and women of the dead years. I looked in at the low window as I went by. Laura was half lying on her chair in front of the fire. I could not see her face, only her little head showed dark against the pale blue wall. She was quite still, asleep no doubt. My heart reached out to her as I went on. There must be a God, I thought, and a God who was good. How otherwise could anything be so sweet and dear as she ever been imagined? I walked slowly along the edge of the wood. A sound broke the stillness of the night. It was a rustling in the wood. I stopped and listened. The sound stopped, too. I went on, and now distinctly heard another step that, than mine, answer mine like an echo. It was a poacher or a wood stealer, most likely, for these were not unknown in our Arcadian neighborhood. But whoever it was, he was a fool not to step more lightly. I turned into the wood, and now the footsteps seemed to come from the path I had just left. It must be an echo, I thought. The wood looked perfect in the moonlight. 
The large dying ferns and the brushwood showed where, through thinning foliage, the pale light came down. The tree trunks stood up like gothic columns all around me. They reminded me of the church, and I turned into the beer balk and passed through the corpse gate through graves to the low porch. I paused through for a moment on the stone seat where Laura and I had watched the fading landscape. Then I noticed that the door to the church was open, and I blamed myself for having left it unlatched the other night. We were the only people who ever cared to come to the church except on Sundays, and I was vexed to think that through our carelessness, damp autumn airs had had a chance of getting in and injuring the old fabric. I went in. It will seem strange, perhaps, that I should have gone halfway up the aisle before I remembered, with a sudden chill followed by a sudden rush of self-contempt, that this was the very day and hour when, according to tradition, the shapes drawed out man size and marble began to walk. Having thus remembered the legend, and remembered it with a shiver, of which I was ashamed, I could not do otherwise than walk up to the altar just to look at the figures. As I said to myself, really what I wanted to do was assure myself, first, that I did not believe the legend, and secondly, that it was not true. I was rather glad that I had come. I thought now I could tell Mrs. Dorman how vain her fancies were, and how peacefully the marble figures slept through the ghastly hour. With my hands in my pockets, I passed up the aisle. In the gray dim light, the eastern end of the church looked larger than usual, and the arches above the two tombs looked larger, too. The moon came out and showed me the reason. I stopped short, my heart gave a leap that nearly choked me, and then sank sickingly. The bodies drawed out man size were gone, and their marble slabs lay wide and bare in the vague moonlight that slanted through the east window. Were they really gone? Or was I mad? Clenching my nerves, I stooped and passed my hand over the smooth slabs and felt their black and broken surface. Had someone taken the things away? Was it some vile practical joke? I would make sure anyway. In an instant, I had made a torch of a newspaper, which happened to be in my pocket, and lighting it, held it high above my head. Its yellow glare illumined the dark arches in those slabs. The figures were gone, and I was alone in the church. Or was I alone? And then a horror seized me, a horror indefinable and indescribable, an overwhelming certainty of supreme and accomplished calamity. I flung down the torch and tore along the aisle and out through the porch, biting my lips as I ran to keep myself from shrieking aloud. Oh, was I mad? Or was that this that possessed me? I leaped the churchyard wall and took a straight cuddle across the fields, led by the light from our windows. Just as I got over the first stile, a dark figure seemed to spring out of the ground. Mad still with the certainty of misfortune, I made for the thing that stood in my path, shouting, Get out of my way, can't you? But my push met with more vigorous resistance than I had expected. My arms were caught just above the elbow and held in a vice, and the raw-boned Irish doctor actually shook me. Would ye? He cried in his own mistakable ac accents. Would ye then? Let me go, you fool, I gasped. The marble figures have gone from the church. I tell you, they're gone. He broke, broke into a ringing laugh. I have to give you a drop tomorrow, I see. You've been smoking too much and listening to old wives' tales. I tell you, I've seen the bare slabs. Well, come back with me. I'm going up to old Palmer's. His daughter's ill. We'll look into the church and let me see the bare slabs. You go if you like, I said a little less frantic for his laughter. I'm going home to my wife. Rubbish, man, said he. Did you think I'd permit of that? Are you going to say all your life that you've seen solid marble endowed with vitality and me to go all me life saying you was a coward? No, sir, you shan't do it. The night air, a human voice, and I think also the physical contact with the six feet of solid common sense brought me back a little to my ordinary self, and the word coward was a mental shower bath. Come on, then, I said sullenly. Perhaps you're right. He still held my arm tightly. We got over the stile and back to the church. All was still as death. The place smelled very damp and earthy. We walked up the aisle. I was not ashamed to confess that I shut my eyes. I knew the figures would not be there. I heard Kelly strike a match. Here they are, you see. Right enough, you've been dreaming or drinking asking your pardon for the imputation. I opened my eyes. By Kelly's expiring vesta, I saw two shapes lying in their marble on their slabs. I drew a deep breath and caught his hand. I'm awfully indebted to you, I said. It must have been some trick of the light, or I've been working too hard. Perhaps that's it. Do you know, I was quite convinced they were gone. I'm aware of that, he answered rather grimly. 
You have to be careful of that brain of yours, my friend, I assure you. He was leaning over and looking at the right-hand figure, whose stony face was the most villainous and deadly in expression. By Jove, he said, something has been afoot here, his hand's broken. And so it was. I was certain that it had been perfect the last time Laura and I had been there. Perhaps someone's tried to remove them, said the doctor. That won't count for my impression, I objected. Too much painting and tobacco counts for that well enough. Come along, I said, or my wife will be getting anxious. You'll come in and have a drop of whiskey and drink confusion to ghosts and better sense to me. I ought to go up to Palmer's, but it's too late now. I best leave it till morning, he replied. I was kept late at the Union, and I've had to see a lot of people since. All right, I'll come back with you. I think he fancied I needed him more than did Palmer's girl. So, discussing how such an illusion could have been possible and deducing from this experience large generalities considering ghostly apparitions, we walked up to our cottage. We saw, as we walked up the garden path, the bright light streamed out of the front door and presently saw that the parlor door was open, too. Had she gone out? Come in, I said, and Dr. Kelly followed me into the parlor. It was all ablaze with candle. Not only the wax ones, but at least a dozen guttering, glaring tallow dips stuck in vases and ornaments in unlikely places. Light, I knew, was Lara's remedy for nervousness. Poor child, why did I leave? Well, I had a left her, brute that I was. We glanced around the room, and at first we did not see her. The window was open, and the drop set all the candles flaring one way. Her chair was empty, and her handkerchief and book lay on the floor. I turned to the window. There in the recess of the window I saw her. Oh, my child, my love, had she gone to that window to watch for me? And what had come in the room behind her? To what had she turned with that look of frantic fear and horror? Oh, my little one, had she thought it was I whose step she heard and turned to meet what? She'd fallen back across the table in the window, and her body lay half on it and half on the window seat, and her head hung down over the table. The brown hair loosened and fallen to the carpet. Her lips were drawn back and her eyes wide, wide open. They saw nothing now. What had they seen last? The doctor moved towards her, but I pushed him aside and sprang to her, caught her in my arms and cried, It's all right, Laura. I've got you safe, wifey. She fell into my arms in a heap. I clasped her and kissed her and called her by all her pet names, but I think I knew all the time that she was dead. Her hands were tightly clenched. In one of them, she held something fast. When I was quite sure that she was dead and that nothing mattered at all anymore, I let him open her hand to see what she held. It was a gray marble finger. As if your first breath here on earth stole the very wind out of my nose And every word off of my tongue I've been a vessel up till now Son But what makes do you want? But what makes do you want? Left out your feet as we moved out into the night. 